Okay, hi. So my name is Ed Friedman. For those of you that don't know me, I chair Friends of Mary Meeting Bay. We have a new executive director, Jennifer Brockway. Jennifer, raise your hand. There we go. There she is. Um, got any questions about what we're doing? Aside from technical questions, <laughs> you can talk to Jennifer or myself. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Friends of Mary Meeting Bay, and I'm going to pass around a sign-up sheet, if you would sign that, please, so we know who you are, and we get a sense of how many people come to which talk and helps us better uh, figure out what to offer in the future. Um, also, we have this basket here, which the series has for many years been sponsored in part by Patagonia down in Freeport. And they usually donate, they always donate, some merchandise that we offer as an incentive for a raffle, a little door prize thing. And tonight, I was in such a hurry and had such a big list when I left home that I forgot to bring the door prizes, which are a door. No. Oh. A cat. No. Hat. Yeah, a hat. <laughs> All right. And a little oh no. Change No, yeah, close enough. A little bag. <laughs> so we can uh, we can have I was going to say, uh, put your name on the thing and put some money in the basket and we will get your prizes to you. But we have had a, uh, a sudden donor, which is great, who offered us this wonderful vest as a door prize. What size? Look at all those, what size? <laughs> small. It says extra small, actually. But yes, it's got so. an awful lot of pockets for being so extra small. <laughs> and I'm sure those of you that are large, God, it sure looks big, doesn't it? It does. It does. All right. It's probably just the thing a sea lamp right biologist ought to be wearing in the field. Yeah. So I usually wear a, a large, and I'd say it fits, well, it's a little snug for that. For that. <laughs> anyway. So instead of the Patagonia hats tonight, it's a fortuitous donation here. We will offer this vest as a uh, door prize. And what we ask is that this, this series costs us uh, well over $1,000 a year to put on. And so this is partly why we do, we do this. Um, there's a little thing with scrap paper in it. Write your name on a piece of paper, stick it in the tin. Put some money, hopefully like five dollars, ten dollars, a million dollars in the basket, and we'll have a drawing. I'd say the odds are really, really good. Tonight. <laughs> yeah. So, um, if you look around you here, um, you see these wonderful tapestries that cover up with some of our literature. Um, but we have uh, some of these trifolds here about what we do here, there, and in the back. Uh, Friends of Mary Bay is a very unique organization in that we are an environmental group, as you know, but we do um, on research, we do advocacy work, we do land conservation work, and we have a very active education program. Hi, Carol. So, so we um, have done a lot of work on not lampreys, but eels. People often think they're the same, but they're not. Um, litigation with the BEP, the Bureau of Environmental Protection, the DEP. Uh, we've been in court over the eels. Uh, we work a lot with fish passage, trying to improve fish passage for all of the migratory fish, whether they are anadromous, most of their time in the ocean, come up here to spawn, or catadromous, like the eel, most of their time in freshwater, go out to sea to spawn. So, um, advocacy work on pollutants, toxics, uh, pesticides in schools, uh, see some literature over there on wireless uh, devices, Wi-Fi, uh, smart meters, uh, cell phones. I've been doing this work for many, 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 many years, and I consider wireless proliferation to be the most serious toxic threat of our time it's everywhere. A lot of people, people getting cancer from it, particularly phones, but people getting a lot of other sicknesses from just being around it. So. Uh, and it affects wildlife and plants as well. Uh, we've protected well over 1,000 acres, 1,200, 1,500 acres around the bay. Some of it conservation easement, some of it is now owned by the state. Um, 
we have some picture books over here, ring binders on each of the different subject areas. So there's some maps in there. Um, we just completed another easement. Uh, what month are we in now? Yeah, December. Uh, a few couple months ago. Uh, focus of ours is on the bay and the tributaries. Six tributaries coming into the bay. So this is uh, a piece, 47 acres, protecting some of the headwaters of the bay. Education. Some of you may know, a lot of you don't know. I see a lot of new faces here. Very active education program, both in schools and twice a year outside of schools, we do a bay day, fall and spring bay day. We have a couple hundred or so kids, generally fourth, fifth graders from around the bay, come out to a site on the bay. We do active hands-on education with them, get them really dirty, have a lot of fun. Uh, fish printing, goyotaku. Uh, Japanese way of preserving your catch, uh, watershed modeling, real archaeology, um, beach sanding, see who we catch the time of year. Kids love it. We've had kids not want to go home. They say, I want to stay and be an archaeologist. So hopefully we provide a formative experience that maybe comes back to them later on, if not right then. So like the Harry Potter train they get on, they just disappeared? Excuse me? Did the archaeology world, like the Harry Potter train, they get on? Yeah. When they say, I want to be an archaeologist, except for them. They, 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 they just go. Get up and go. So, I mean, we've had kids find musket balls, um, you know, arrowheads, uh, all sorts of, you know, pottery, glass, you name it, depending on the site that we've been working at. So, Great. And it's, it's, it's very, it, one of our archaeologists at one of the sites we use, the state site, we've got to be sort of certified to run the dig there. He was a little jaded years ago. He didn't really want to help us and do it. And he came out there, and we saw the enthusiasm that these kids had just in finding bits of glass and brick, and it just lit his fire again. It was really, really nice. So, so we, you get that when you're working with the kids. Um, we have a lot of volunteers. We have an extraordinarily, extraordinarily high rate of volunteerism in the group, and there's probably, I don't know, 30% volunteers out of our 400, 450 members. So there's a lot of opportunities for volunteering, and if anyone is interested on that sign-up sheet, you can check that off. The education is a big place uh, for that. Uh, water quality monitoring, we've been water quality monitoring for a long time all around the bay, up to various tributaries, a concerted effort over the years to upgrade the lower part of the Androscoggin from Brunswick Dam up to the Warumbo Dam. It's a Class C. Now we'd like to get it to Class B. That's what it measures when you go out and, and measure it. And the reason we try and upgrade is the Clean Water Act and Maine statute have anti-degradation language. It says once you get up, you can't backslide. You know, and we have just filed another uh, proposal to upgrade this section. Every so often the DEP asks for proposals to do that, and we, we got it together and got it in in time. To, uh, so we'll see what happens. So, so water quality, uh, education, archaeology digs in the summer we often have. It's a lot of opportunity, and if you're interested in helping with anything or stuffing envelopes, uh, just please check that off, and, and myself or Jennifer will get back to you. So I um, think that's most of what I have about us. Again, visit, visit with the information here afterwards. We also have juice and cookies, and I'll hopefully say this again at the end, but our next speaker presentation is uh, in December. They are always the second Wednesday of the month. This one will be a combination of annual meeting, which will just take a few minutes. Potluck supper, which is really, really good. And our speaker, uh, Lee Cranmer, former uh, historic archaeologist with the Maine Historic Preservation Commission. And his talk is called A Tale of Three Privies. <laughs> perfect, perfect title for a potluck supper. <laughs> so uh, that'll be over at uh, the Cram Alumni Building in Bowdoin, which is the second building down on Federal Street from the light on Bath Road and on the uh, east side of the road. Parking is off of Bath Road in the big parking lot. You cut up a little path back to the, to the building. So hopefully you can make it there. There's a yellow postcard over there that's got our entire series schedule on it. Our speaker tonight, Steve Coughlin, patiently uh, waiting for our glitches to get fixed, hopefully, and waiting for me. Uh, he's come all the way down from Bangor to talk to you tonight. Farther north than that. Farther north. The Great, far, the great far White North. Township. 
Where? where? Argyle, Argyle Township. Argyle Township. Where, where is that? Uh, that's north of Old Town. Yeah, okay. It's unorganized. Unorganized. Yeah, it's barely on the map. That's best, right? right? 120 yes. people? About 180, yeah. And, and you got like 10 feet of snow up there, right? Uh, it, it melted yesterday, unfortunately, uh -huh. yeah. So, so Steve got his uh, bachelor's degree uh, from SUNY New York, State University of New York, over at Syracuse, College of Environment and Forestry, and he stayed on to do his PhD there. Uh, focuses on, um, well, his degree in fisheries and wildlife management, but, uh, and your, your bachelor's was also on uh, fisheries. Yeah, fisheries and wildlife, wildlife as well. in general. Yeah. So you just keep on, keep on playing with fish. Well, you'll see the stuff I do. Yeah, so anyway. Um, Steve's Something. been at the um, at University of Maine for a while, 2012, and he's on their faculty. 2006. 2006. Well, I'm sorry. 2000, I think yeah, I think your information's off. <laughs> 2000. I thought I even saw that on your CV. I thought on the. Mm, yeah. No. No. Boy, time's flown if it's been that quick. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, it's been a, it's been 12 years now. As a professor. As a professor. For the whole time? Okay. Yeah. Right. I should let him tell you about himself. <laughs> so, um, not really exciting. But, These um, are exciting things. He, he's done a lot of neat work with uh, community ecology and with a focus on the fish again. And, and hopefully tonight we'll talk about some of the relationships that the lamprey has with other, other species as well. Um, some interesting work, po uh, postdoc, right in Arkansas. In Arkansas, yep. Uh, using otoliths, ear bone. And I didn't, need, I didn't know you could look at chemistry of otoliths. Yep, so to, you can. To you need really expensive equipment. Infer all sorts of things about the organisms and the community from your ear bone. And I thought you just could tell age from it, you know, like tree rings. So, um, um, yeah, so Steve teaches a number of courses. He's doing active work, community ecology work around Atlantic salmon and other critters. Uh, uh, let me see here. I get the name right. Uh, Sejunkadunk, right? Yeah, when we'll be. Yeah. Referring to it here. A lot of work on Sejunkadun stream, lampreys, and other critters. So um, I think without further ado, right, Steve Coughlin, and yeah, so this? you can put this on your, uh, slip on your hip somewhere. It's not right, not too close to your face. All right. Just get your okay. beard up here. You know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> put it right down your, feel like a fishing fly right there. That probably would work. Yeah. Right here? Yeah. All right. That's cool. Okay, let's begin. So I'm sorry, I'm going to be tied over to this console here. I can sit there and hit the button for you. That's all right. It's probably easier this way. You can't read my mind. I hope not, unless that's what this thing's for. No, it's okay. No, it's okay. It's fine. It's okay. Um, actually, if you wouldn't mind dimming the lights just a little bit, this one is sort of right in my face. <laughs> but I can look here. Anyway, so... Um, oh, okay. Well, yeah, whatever. All right, um, so I, there's gonna be a lot of information coming, coming through here. There are three really good, good texts um, that really summarize 100 years of literature on lamprey, and that one up there, Life Without Jaws, is, is really readable for someone who's scientifically literate but not an expert in the field. Um, so a lot of the information that I'm showing you comes from those, sort of a general overview on lamprey, life history, and then I want to uh, give credit to three grad students plus a colleague, collaborator of mine, Joe Zedleski. We're going to be uh, talking about some of the work that the grad students mostly do and I get a little bit of credit for um, about lamprey specifically within Maine watersheds. So if you recall, maybe some of you way back to your introductory biology class, you probably learned about these ancient jawless fish and the two living representatives we have today would be lamprey, the, the adult and the larvae on the top there, and then the hagfish, the adult and the larvae on the bottom. Maybe seem familiar, maybe you even uh, spent some time dissecting them in your anatomy class. And they're a really good uh, representation of a living fossil. Lampreys really are living fossils. They first appear in the fossil re record, oh, about 450 to 470 million years ago in pretty similar form to they are today. And really compared to um, how long lampreys have been around, you know, humans have been here in the blink of an eye and maybe we'll be gone in the blink of an eye. I don't know. Let's see if we can get lampreys to go extinct before us or after us. We'll see. <laughs> We're doing a good job. 
Um, anyway, so um, there was a tremendous radiation of these jawless fishes, depending on how you define fish, back you know 480 to 450 million years ago, and there were a lot of really crazy things that you might remember again from your your vertebrate anatomy textbook. But really, there are only two um, living groups that have survived those mass extinctions: the lamprey and the hagfish. Um, but they've been around for a very, very long time. And this chart just shows you their, uh, their evolutionary time scale and also the relationships with other animals that we have more familiarity with, you know, the birds, the amphibians, the reptiles, and the mammals. And lampreys are considered true vertebrates. And so lampreys are essentially the sister group with everything else you see up here. Um, so all these groups share a common ancestor going way back five, almost 500 million years ago. And those hagfishes, there's still argument, are they actually truly a vertebrate? Are they closely related to lampreys? Are they something else entirely? Um, but for our purposes, we, don't, we can forget that. And looking at lamprey, we see that they retain an awful lot of ancient characteristics. I wouldn't call them primitive. That has a really negative connotation. And lampreys are doing for the most part very well, having this very ancient body plan. They don't have a bony skeleton, no true jaws, no paired fins, no gill cover, no, um, they have seven external gill slits, no scales, all of these things really distinguish them from, from the, the more modern fishes. Um, they're almost completely, car they're completely cartilaginous on the inside, they're notochord, they're brain case, they have little rudiments of vertebrae, and they have a filter feeding larvae, so very ancient fish. It's actually cartilage, and they're just little, little tiny. Uh, I, I couldn't say remnants. They're sort of the precursors of a of large vertebrate that we see in, in the other other animals. And um, if we look at the larval stage of the lamprey, also called an amacete, very, very similar morphologically and structurally to what we think the, the, the ancestral chordate looked like, these little filter feeding things with a very simple um, internal skeleton. And if you remember again from your biology classes, the tunicates or um, sea squirts, squirts have this uh, uh, larvae that looks very similar to a lamprey, and that's probably what the earliest vertebrates looked like, those things. So the lamprey, at least the larvae, um, resembles very superficially some ancient organisms. And and then um, just putting them in context, in context related to the rest of the vertebrates that we know and love. Lamprey don't have true jaws, as shown up on the top there. They just have essentially a, a hole. And the first and second gill arches in these ancient fishes um, were what evolved into the jaws. The first gill arch is the jaw, the second gill arch is the, the suspension, and that's an evolutionary novelty you know, that gave rise you know, to the success of sharks and, and all other vertebrates. So lamprey don't have those jaws, but you'll see in just a minute they do have very characteristic mouths. So current diversity, there's about 44 species that are alive today globally. Um, there are both parasitic and non-parasitic forms. And the non-parasitic ones, I think, are very interesting, but sort of beyond the scope of our talk, because the name of the talk today is sea lamprey. So we do have one species here in Maine, and that is the sea lamprey, Petromyzon marinus. Petro means stone, myzon means to suck, and marinus is of the sea, um, which is a pretty good name. A lot of the Latin names actually have so are really uh, relevant to the, to the organism. So that's the one species that we have here in Maine. And... Maybe my pointer will work. It's not hooked up to anything, so. Ah, yes. So here we are looking on the top of the North Pole. There's no ice over Greenland. But anyway, so here's essentially um, the global distribution of the sea lamprey in red there. So essentially up and down the Atlantic coast, across to Greenland, and over northern Europe into the Mediterranean. And there's a similar species, um, essentially the same sort of species, closely related over in the west or the eastern part of that range. If we go to the US, um, for a very long time, this is what we thought the distribution of sea lamprey were, um, native to the Atlantic coast, um, going up a little bit farther north, up, in, up into New Brunswick. Um, but then uh, exotic species here in the Great Lakes and also the Finger Lakes and Lake Champlain. And oh, about 
50, almost 15 years ago or now or so, um, these researchers, John Waldman, he'll, his name will come up, um, they did some DNA analysis of these lamprey and they hypothesized or they strongly suggest that lamprey, sea lamprey were native to Lake Ontario and Finger Lakes and, and Lake Champlain. And so then the map was revised to look something like this. So they're probably exotic to the upper Great Lakes above the Welland Canal, Lake Erie and above. And of course, there's always people arguing in the literature. There's this guy, Randy Eschenroder, who says, no, Waldman's full of garbage. Um, and he reconstructed the colonization history. And he argues that the lamprey were actually non-native. And when canals were built, they, they penetrated from the Susquehanna drainage up into Lake Ontario. Um, so anyway, there's controversy over whether they're native or landlocked or native or invasive to the Great Lakes. Um, it doesn't really matter though because they're treated as if they are an exotic species. So everybody's probably, or maybe you're not familiar, um, they do get a very bad rap and probably for good, per good, good reasons in the Great Lakes. Um, they're considered to be alien invaders. Um, they're parasitic and we'll get into that in just a second, but you can see the mouth there. Um, you know, they, they're, they're not warm and fuzzy and cuddly like a lot of our charismatic species. And they do do damage to native fish, well, and exotic fish as well, uh, places like the Great Lakes. Um, this is not so common anymore, but used to be very common where these large sport fish, in this case it would be exotic Pacific salmon, um, get attacked by lampreys pretty, pretty frequently. A lot of scarring, a lot of wounds on them. And there's been a, a lamprey control pro program in place for about 40 years now, um, where a lot of money is spent, I think a oh, total $20 billion a year. So some of that's spent on poisoning streams. Um, they dump some lamprecide in to kill the larvae. And then there's also barriers and traps and pheromones that are used to, to attract and to, to capture and kill spawners. Um, but they are managed as an exotic species in the Great Lakes. And there's some pretty good evidence that they did a lot of damage um, once they colonized, colonized Lake Superior here to the lake trout fishery. Seeing wounds like that was very common. Lake trout essentially plummeted about the same time that lamprey were introduced or so. And then uh, the stream treatments, the lamprecide came online in about 1960, lamprey populations dropped, and then lake trout wounding rates dropped and their populations went up as well. So it appears that the, that the control of, of sea lamprey in Lake Ontario and other, other great lakes has been pretty successful. So lampreys, sea lampreys have a really interesting, complicated life history. So they have this juvenile stage, they're not a sexually mature adult yet, where they're parasitic. They latch onto the, um, the outside of, of fish and other vertebrates if they were in the ocean. They migrate up freshwater streams to spawn. Um, they build these elaborate nests and you'll see some more, more videos and details of all these. Um, the eggs hatch out very quickly and these larvae adopt a filter feeding lifestyle, non-parasitic, and they can live in the streams, burrowed in the mud, essentially just feeding on little parts of particles of detritus for maybe up to 15 years depending on their growth rate. They undergo a metamorphosis, they transform into a parasitic stage, and go back down to either a large lake or the open ocean. And so we'll just look a little bit more closely at those life history stages. So these larvae, these guys are, are really cool, but they're very small, and unless you were really looking for these, you'd never see them in the stream. But they, they dig these little tunnels, um, and they essentially filter feed like little vacuums. Um, you can see one of them there, well, they have, they've all got their mouths open. And they essentially use that oral hood of theirs to vacuum up particles that have settled out on uh, um, the gravel and the sand. And they'll live anywhere from three to 15 to 20 years, depending on their growth rate and the amount of fats they can store in their body. They go through metamorphosis um, at some point in time. And so you can see this, the different stages they go through looking at them laterally. They develop um, a really prominent eye. If you look on the right there, you can see how the mouth parts change from a, from a simple filter feeding hood to those keratinized teeth and the rasping tongue. They actually can stick on a, a, a fish and rasp that tongue in almost like a little jackhammer and pull out bits of blood and flesh. And here in Maine, um, there is a little bit of predation 
or parasitism that goes on in streams. When these transformers are, um, they've metamorphosed, they can start to tolerate seawater, they start going downstream, they might hitch a ride on a fish, this happens to be a stocked brook trout, and get a, a quick burst of, of nutrients and energy and that sort of sustains them till they get down the open ocean. But for the most part, there's no parasitism on sport fish or any fish here in Maine. All that, except for you know in these limited instances, are out in the open ocean. So sea lampreys don't parasitize fish in main streams. And of course, once they do go down to the open ocean or the lake, um, they lead a parasitic existence for uh, one to two years. And very, very well adapted for latching onto fish and sucking out bits of flesh and, and fluid and blood and things like that. Um, and back before lamprey treatment, pictures like that up at the top were, were not uncommon at all. And you could imagine that a fish can't survive a whole lot of lamprey woundings. All right, so now let's see if this actually works. Um, I have videos here. Ah, okay, yes. So in the, in the spring, I'll talk a little louder over the gurgling. So in the springtime, um, triggered by photo period, temperature, and discharge, lampreys make their way up a stream. Um, they actually follow chemical cues of either larval lamprey, or the females will follow cues, cues of males who are actually following the cue, cues of the larvae. Um, so they don't home to natal streams like salmon or trout do. Um, they simply go wherever the, the odor is, is the best that attracts them. Oh, I didn't want to give that part away. Um, so let's see, will this work? Okay, so once they get up, come on. Hmm, maybe this one is not going to work then. Okay, how about... Hmm. No, I guess we're frozen. All right. Well, that picture doesn't want to, or that video doesn't want to play. Let's try this one. Okay, so they build these elaborate pit and mound structures, nests. Um, they grab, this one doesn't show it quite as well, but they'll grab onto rocks with their sucker disc, disc mouths and pull them down and they'll pile them up in a mound. They'll undulate their bodies and clear fine sediment. Yeah, you can see one dragging it there. Um, you can see the male, that's the one grabbing the rock right now. He's got that thick almost rope structure on his back. Underneath is where the testes are and there's a female there. And well, that doesn't want to work either. This is the good one too. This is the spawning. Uh, no, I guess it is not going to work. Oh, maybe it will. Okay. So anyway, so here's here's two lamprey. They spent a whole bunch of time building their nests. Um, they do nest communally, but these, this happens to be just a, a pair by themselves. And there's a little, pretty elaborate courtship ritual. They do a lot of uh, stroking and arousing and, and whatnot. See one coming right there. You know, they're, they're obviously enjoying each other here. In just a minute, you'll see um, the actual spawning process. Um, also take note, watch, look how fast their gill pouches there are ventilating really energetically intensive. They're burning themselves out metabolically. They're not feeding while well in their streams. They're up there for, for one purpose and one purpose only. And it's sort of like a Pacific salmon. They, they die after spawning and they just essentially burn themselves out metabolically. And they're gonna get to it in just a minute here. I could watch these videos all day long and sometimes I do. <laughs> You'll see they're, they're getting ready. Arch the back in just a minute. And that's, so that's essentially spawning right there. There we go. And so you can kind of see those little, little tiny eggs. They're adhesive. They sink down into the substrate. And they hatch in about, oh, seven to ten days. Okay. 
Well, most of those videos worked. We have a few, few later on. But then ultimately they die. And I had a video of this and couldn't find it, but there's a, you can see the snapping turtle is grabbing that lamprey and its pouches are going like crazy. And, but um, so very much like a Pacific salmon, they're genetically programmed to die after they go up in, in, in fresh water. So that's essentially their life history. And so now let's get more into the ecology, the roles that they play, the interactions they have um, with other fish in Maine. So historically in Maine, we had a lot of species of what we call anadromous or diadromous or sea run fish. This is a shot from the uh, Milford Fish Ladder, um, the observation window on the Penobscot River. And we can see four of the big players here. We see a sea lamprey up there, an Atlantic salmon right below it. Then there's a big American shad right below that salmon, and then the rest of those fish are river herring, either alewife or blueback herring. Um, so historically, back pre-colonial times, uh, Maine had, and still does to varying degrees, about 12 sea run species. Most of these are anadromous, and one of them, the American eel, is catadromous, as I was saying about before. So the lamprey were one species in this pretty diverse community of sea run fish. Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah, so top, oh, actually I have this. American eel, American shad, striped bass, short nose sturgeon, Atlantic salmon, rainbow smelt, uh, brook trout, which can be sea, sea run as well. Um, that is a blueback herring, there's an Atlantic sturgeon, there's an alewife, there's a tomcod, also known as a frost fish, and then there's the sea lamprey. So there's the 12 species that historically made up this sea run fish community. And when these fish were abundant, rivers were essentially full of fish most seasons out of the year. So this is a, a very complicated diagram here showing seasons going from spring all the way to fall and then down from the estuary and the ocean up into uh, freshwater streams and up into lakes. And it shows the, the, the movements and the, diff the different life stages of various species. There's always some sort of sea run fish in a river. And I guess these red ones here just show when the lamprey larvae are in, they're in tributaries, the adults come up in um, May or so, and the transformers would leave in November. But they're really one of only, they're only one of many fish that happen to be coexisting in these streams. Well, you all know the story for a variety of reasons, overfishing, pollution, um, deforestation, um, but especially dams, um, these sea run fish have declined markedly and in many places have gone extinct with industrialization. And oh, there's John Waldman again, the uh, proponent of the native Lake Ontario lamprey up on the right there with Karin Lindbergh and they wrote this very famous influential paper Oh, it's probably about 10 years ago now where they documented the declines in these diadromous fish in North America. And they use American shad as, as an example because they had really good data on it. And they, they documented what are called shifting baselines. So depending on your, your, your window or your frame of reference, how far you go back in time to try to um, use historical data to piece together what these fisheries look like, you, you would get very different results. So typically people would refer back to the 1880s and say that was the heyday of shad. Um, we want to restore our rivers to have shad as abundant as they were you know, 150 years ago. But then in some cases, they have better data going back and saying, well, even earlier on, shad were even more and more and more abundant. So as time passes, as memories fade, people forget what these streams used to have, we have this phenomenon called shifting baselines where we have different reference points for what restoration or recovery looks like. So, you know, back in the day before European colonization, all these sea run fish, huge abundance, they were easy to exploit, they were really important for food and for other, other economic uses. And then people started to dam waterways, deforest, pollute, etc., etc. You know the story. Um, and fisheries have declined, and that now is coupled with uh, loss of memory of what these really large runs used to be. And so when people don't remember what they were like, they're less inclined to invest money to try to bring back these streams to what they formerly were, or even if, if they could be. Um, and so sea lamprey are probably in that place with a lot of these other fish, is they used to be super abundant, very important, but we just 
don't know how abundant or how important. Well, everybody's familiar with the story of Atlantic salmon. Um, Atlantic salmon, the declines have been noticed for many years, very popular sport and food and commercial fish. Um, so been a lot of efforts, mostly with stocking, to stem the decline and to help recover Atlantic salmon. Um, and we even had a, an agency that was devoted entirely to Atlantic salmon. Now it's called um, the Bureau of Sea Run Fisheries, but it used to be focused mostly on or entirely on Atlantic salmon. So the focus back for a declining fish species was just stock the hell out of it and see what happens. And of course that hasn't worked too well. Maybe for Atlantic salmon it's slowed extinction a little bit, but it hasn't really done anything to recovery. So something like the Atlantic salmon, the Gulf of Maine a distinct population segment was listed as endangered in 2000, um, and it was relisted in 2009 to include a lot of other watersheds, including here the, the Kennebec and Druscoggin. And of course there were Atlantic salmon all the way down to the, the Long Island Sound. Those have gone extinct. These guys are endangered. And clearly what we've been doing has not brought them back. So there's been a shift and don't worry, getting back to sea lamprey here, I know talking a lot about salmon. So there's been a shift really in the mindset, the paradigm of managers. So instead of focusing on just restoring or recovering single species through say stocking or habitat protection, now the focus is on communities and entire ecosystems required to support these species of interest. So not only Atlantic salmon, but these other co-evolved species. And just an example of what this paper did was it tried to go back and look at an appropriate baseline. And so all these major rivers in Maine are listed here, showing how many, if there's an estimate for how many Atlantic salmon or shad or herring used to be present. So for example, just here in the Kennebec River, you know, 200,000 Atlantic salmon, 250,000 shad, and probably maybe tens of millions of, of river herring in Alwife. They just have no idea. The point is, an awful lot of fish um, that are no longer here in anywhere near the numbers they were. So the idea that these uh, Rory Saunders and his co-authors and these the, the, the new agencies today um, have adopted is instead of just looking at Atlantic salmon in isolation, they want to restore entire communities and ecosystems on which these salmon depend. So they argue that these sea-run fish like alewife, shad, and sea lamprey are important to Atlantic salmon and nursery streams for essentially four main reasons. So these fish provide food for predators. So Atlantic salmon coming up in the spring to, to spawn or over overwintering from their spawning the previous fall, they would encounter rainbow smelt coming up the stream. And these salmon are, are very skinny, they've lost a lot of body weight. Those rainbow smelt come in an opportune time for, for um, refueling those salmon. Prey buffering. If you imagine, uh, sorry, I didn't have a picture of this, but if you could imagine a little Atlantic salmon, small to silvery fish like this, swimming downstream, it's pretty vulnerable to predation unless there are millions of silvery fish about this big, like alewife and river herring, swimming upstream to giving them cover. Fish like sea lamprey especially, but also alewife that come up in huge massive numbers, deliver a lot of energy and nutrients that they sequestered out in the sea and they essentially fertilize freshwater streams. And then there's habitat conditioning where there's some physical disturbance to the substrate and you'll see, well, you've already seen how lamprey do that. And so fish that do many of these things so significantly that they actually impact the whole structure and function of ecosystems, we would call them ecosystem engineers. And that's where I'm going with the lamprey. We can go out on the west coast and find examples of Pacific salmon very easily. Pacific salmon are classic ecosystem engineers. They come upstream in, in huge quantities, they disturb the substrate, they clear out fine sediment, they make these really complex habitats, but they also die and their carcasses rot and they fertilize streams. Those nutrients find their way up into um, Douglas firs and grizzly bears and eagles um, and salmon berries and whatnot. And so salmon are the ecosystem engineers of western streams. And the question we had was, well, are sea lamprey the closest thing that we have here to ecosystem engineers in Atlantic coast streams? And if they are, uh, restoring or conserving or strengthening sea lamprey populations would be vital for recovering Atlantic salmon. 
And so the uh, focus in the past 10 to 15 years or so has been on removing dams to restore these important species out in the Pacific Northwest to restore Pacific salmon, but also Pacific, Pacific lamprey. And out here in the, in the Atlantic coast, a lot of the things that we've done to our fisheries here over the last 200 years are just playing out now in the Pacific coast streams. So uh, people from the West and East coast are, are looking at each other's systems as examples for what works and what doesn't. And so the, the drive today is for dam removal and people have done a lot of work looking at the responses of salmon on the West coast and starting to look at responses of other species here on the East coast. I probably don't have to tell you guys about dam removal. You know, you, you were the, the first big um, uh, dam in Maine, Fort Edwards Dam, to come down. Um, what is that, 20 years ago now? Something like that? 1998. So yeah, almost 20 years ago. And of course, it's been, from what we can tell, a lot of his success story. Uh, millions of alewife have come back. Um, alewife predominantly. There's also some, some good news for Atlantic salmon in the Kennebec River, especially in the Sandy Creek drainage or Sandy River drainage. Um, so you guys have, have lived through this and seen the benefits of dam removal. Well, we're just starting to do this a little bit north of here, and I work mostly in the Penobscot River, so I'll talk about the Penobscot River. And um, if you're not familiar with it, it was a plan that's um, pretty close to being completed. Uh, two large main stem dams were removed down here, um, that dams right around the head of tide, and then now the uppermost, the lowermost dam is right here in Milford. So now fish have essentially unlimited access um, to this area here. A couple other dams over on this branch and up here have uh, modified fish and improved fish passage. So the idea is to um, restore or at least make it easier for fish to access, they still have to go through some dams and fishways, thousands of, of miles of original historic spawning habitat. That's the goal of the Penobscot River Restoration Project. And I've been working on that project in the big river, and you know we see some lamprey in there. Um, but most of the really interesting stuff, at least in, in my mind, goes on in the small streams, not so much the main river. So I'm going to take it to um, Sajunkaduck Stream that, that Ed talked about a few minutes ago as sort of one piece of the Penobscot puzzle. So really functionally, the Penobscot River or any big watershed is, is made up of lots of little tributaries and a lot of the really interesting stuff with biogeochemistry and fish spawning and rearing and productivity goes on in these little streams, not so much the main stem river. So Sajunkadunk Stream is a small watershed. It flows into the Penobscot right around the city of Bangor and Brewer. And um, for a very long time, there were at least two dams in some form or another. Back Going back two, three hundred years ago, there were many dams on the stream. But there's the Mill Dam, which is just upstream of the confluence with the Penobscot. And then there's the Meadow Dam that um, essentially fills those wetlands there. Historically, these ponds and wetlands up here provided spawning area for alewife. So this stream was the focus of a very small scale restoration effort. And this occurred before the Penobscot River Watershed or the Penobscot River Restoration Project. So it was sort of like a precursor, a, a very small experiment. So that mill dam there or sorry, the meadow dam, that was mostly removed and replaced with an engineered rock ramp fishway. There's a nice pool riffle sequence uh, designed to get alewife up into the wetlands to spawn. And the way they engineered it, they actually kept the level of the wetlands um, constant. So they, they protected the, the marshy habitat upstream. And the following year, they took the mill dam out and essentially that's what the, the stream looked like just a few days after removal. Um, and so now for the first time in two or 300 years, sea run fish had access to that entire or most of the watershed. And so we looked at that as an opportunity to watch what happens with dam removal and fish recovery in real time. It was essentially a, a very fortuitous experiment. So among some other things, I'll focus just on the lamprey today. We, a lot of people did a lot of work in that stream. We got our money's worth out of it. Um, but we, what we want to do is, first of all, document any sea lamprey recolonization of newly accessible habitat. If we open it up, will the fish migrate up? And then you also use it to better understand the ecological roles of sea lamprey. Are they really ecosystem engineers? Um, are they necessary or vital for Atlantic salmon restoration? And then it's a good test of whether or not a dam removal had the desired outcomes. 
So what I'll go through now is just uh, show you some of the results that the, my grad students and I and collaborators have done over the course of about 10 years on sea lamp, right? So this stream is pretty easy to work in. It's small, it's um, uh, for the most part um, very easily weightable. You can walk the whole stream in half a day. So we'd set these nets down near the mouth and we'd capture sea lamprey as they were mi migrating up in. So we had for a couple years an extensive capturing, tagging, and tracking protocol for them. And then uh, so we also did nest counts, much like people count reds for salmon as an indicator of abundance, we would do the same thing for sea lamprey. All right, let's see if this works. So just an example, it's actually quite easy to um, capture these guys. So these, these fish have already been captured, usually captured once and let go. We would do a, a survey and we'd find lampreys on their nests and uh, pick them off very carefully, as you'll see. There's one. Nice. Nice. <laughs> and there is another one. Pretty easy. Good job. Yeah. So we pay the undergrads the big bucks for to do that. And then <laughs> this is very low this is low tech stuff. I think this is the, this is the sort of stuff that we should pay undergraduates to. Go out and do physical work. It doesn't cost a whole lot. It's low tech. Get good experience. Um, that's that's my personal opinion. There's a desire to go to very high tech stuff and not a fan for a variety of reasons. Anyway, so we're giving Lamprey here a uh, pit tag. It's essentially almost like a, little, like a little microchip when you drive through the turnpike and you go through the easy pass. That's essentially what it is. It's, an ID, it's got an ID code in it. I don't remember that being injected in me though. <laughs> that was while you were put out. And then there's just a Floyd tag. It's just easier to see that thing on the outside of the Lamprey. And so each Lamprey is marked individually. Um, so we record that and we take lengths and weights of them. And we do this for almost every lamprey in the stream. And let's see. There's that. And then later on, you can see this is grad student Rob Hogg there. He's got a pit tag reader, and it's got essentially a, 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 an antenna that generates an electric field. You wave it over the fish, it's connected to a reader and it records the ID number of the fish. And there he goes. He's got it. So once you capture a lamprey, mark it, you can recapture it again, and using the captures and recaptures, you can develop a population estimate for those fish for that particular spawning run. So we did that for a couple of years. We also um, did simultaneous nest counts where we'd walk the stream every day. We'd count nests, we'd count new nests. We'd have a population estimate of nests. We'd have a population estimate of lampreys. So just some really basic data, ecological data, on this essentially newly colonized area of stream. So just some data pre-removal. You can see these are locations of all these nests, red dots. There was that first dam, so obviously lamprey didn't get above the dam. All the spawning was done below the first dam. And essentially when, uh, when we took the dam, well, we didn't take the dam out. Trained engineers took the dam out. But when the dams came out, um, lamprey could then migrate up here. Um, there's a small waterfalls that's probably a natural barrier, but they essentially colonized all the, the stream that was now accessible to them. Uh, this is 2008 pre-removal. 2009 was a bust because there was a massive flood and we had similar data in 2010. 2011 they penetrated just a little bit farther upstream. So this is sort of the extent after I think they were fully colonized. Very quick, oh very yeah very quick absolutely very quick. And so just a summary, over the five years that we did this, actually there's a six year, I just didn't put it in there, going anywhere from, from zero fish all the way up to 300 fish or 350 for a population estimate. Um, and we got a pretty good relation between the number of nests that we observed and the number of lamprey that we estimated with our population model. So in the future, one could go out to a stream this size, count the nests, and get a, good, a pretty good estimate of the lamprey abundance. And that was the, the point of that study. And we, 
that work? No, that's not going to work. There were video of alewives swimming around, but you've probably seen them. But also recolonizing the stream. Atlantic salmon essentially moved up from the lower reaches past that first dam that was removed within three days. And then three years later, um, we found two age classes of fish throughout the stream. So not high densities, but there was successful spawning. And then alewife came up um, almost immediately. We found adults coming up. Um, in two years after the dam was removed, there were some problems with them getting above that little impassable waterfalls under low flows. Um, but then in August of that year, we found all these juveniles just pouring out of that pond. Um, so these other two big sea run species, the big charismatic ones, they, they I wouldn't say, I want to say they recovered. They were colonized very quickly, within days or within a few years. So, yep, we'll check that off of our list that these three important species did recolonize newly accessible habitat. Then the next question was, what's the effect, the physical and chemical and biological effect of the spawning sea lamprey on stream habitat and the biota? So we had a, a variety of different techniques. We measured fine sediment accumulation, um, how embedded the rocks were in the, in the substrate, depth and velocity profiles, space, interstitial spaces and in rocks that in, invertebrates and fish would use um, for feeding and hiding, um, aquatic insects that are drifting and living on the stream bottom, all in the context of of um, what effects would, would sea lamprey have on all these factors that affect habitat quality for juvenile Atlantic salmon and other stream-dwelling fishes. And just a little bit of data. So here we have, this is actually a diagram of a salmon red, but it's pretty much the same for a lamprey. Water is flowing this way. There's a pit here and there's a mound, the tail spill. Well, essentially that's what the lamprey nests look like. These are just depths. So we measured them in the summer right after spawning, in the fall right after um, three months or four months after spawning. And essentially they were kind of shallow, they got deep, they got really shallow, and then they tapered off again. So they made these sort of speed bumps in the, in the stream. And then these are just various um, estimates of water column velocity, the difference in, in water velocity between the top and the bottom. And we measured it for the mound, that anterior part, or the, the posterior part, the pit, and then an adjacent reference site. But the point is here is that the presence of these nests made very complex depth and velocity profiles on the stream and increased habitat complexity. And some other measures of embeddedness um, after a lamprey got done um, making a nest. It turns out the rocks were much less embedded than they were beforehand and in adjacent reaches that weren't spawned in. They removed a lot of fine sediment, especially in the, in the mound section. And so both of these things together would probably mean fairly good quality habitat for something like an Atlantic salmon that would spawn. Um, needing rocks that aren't embedded in the substrate, that don't have a lot of fine sediment around them. And then interstitial spaces, it turns out that, um, at least in the mound of the, the nest, um, there were a lot of little nooks and crannies that could fit juvenile Atlantic salmon. And we, we did a very rough estimate of how much of the stream bed was actually changed by lamprey. So overall, about 2% of the wetted area of the stream bottom was actually affected, but if we took out all the parts that weren't spawning habitat, the deep, slow, muddy pools, and we focused just on riffly rocky habitats that Atlantic salmon would probably use as well, about a third, a third of the stream habitat was actually impacted by, by lamprey, a relatively small population. Um, so they have the capability of exerting a large effect in large numbers, probably. Pretty good diversity of, of aquatic insects in their nests. Most of them were these chironomids, these uh, midge larvae, and also um, net spinning caddis flies, and then some mayflies. And it turns out that uh, insects living on the stream bottom here, the benthos, um, much higher densities of these insects, especially in the mounds, compared to an undisturbed reach. Um, probably made very good habitat for these, especially these little caddis flies to get in the nooks and crannies and build their catch nets. And then drifting insects, 
Um, we compared drifting insects that came off of an active nest versus just a spot that lampreys weren't disturbing. And it turns out there was a much greater um, abundance, biomass, and diversity of insects that were drifting when lampreys were dislodging them through their spawning activities. That's not a surprise. And so all of those taken together, we would say that the spawning behaviors increased the habitat complexity, it increased insect abundance, and it coarsened the substrate. And so that would probably have some, some pretty um, impactful benefits to drift feeding fish like Atlantic salmon that feed on drifting aquatic insects, or even adult Atlantic salmon that would spawn over similar habitats. And let's see, I really like, there we go. I really like um, feeding of trout, trout and salmon for whatever reason. I like to fly fish. I think the behavior of fish feeding is fantastic. Um, so started looking at the impacts of sea lamprey spawning and how fish actually behave and feed. So there's a couple lamprey down there that are actively spawning and you can see there's just minnows stacked up behind these things. Um, there are at least three species of minnows in there. There's a spawning right there and you can see these big common shiners are popping right into that plume and they're feeding on presumably eggs or benthic invertebrates that are dislodged. Um, but these, these minnows follow these schools of lamprey around and um, very, very ag aggressively darting in and out feeding on the, uh, the disturbance from the lamprey. And I could watch those all day, but I won't subject you to that. So then what we decided to do was um, uh, do some snorkeling and some videography to looking at the foraging behavior and the energetic costs and benefits of those small drift feeding fishes that were associated with lamprey nests. And let's see, maybe this will work. So put up some observation grids and go back and you can measure depth and velocity later and you can look at individual fish position against the grid and figure out um, how fast they were swimming. You can count their tail beat frequencies. Um, so you can see they're, they're darting in and out of those plumes. Um, and they're, they're swimming, this is very, very fast. He, probably a huge energy expenditure for these fish. They typically don't, don't swim that fast, but they're in you know, fast currents here, maintaining their position. And so after about 100 hours of videos like that, I haven't done a whole lot of analysis, um, but from some, some pilot data, some preliminary thoughts that I had was, these minnows respond very quickly to spawning activity, and they engage in other, what otherwise would be risky behavior. They're out in shallow water, um, they're in a whole aggregation of very large fish that are thrashing around, um, they're vulnerable to predation there. They form these really dense roving aggregations and follow these spawning lamprey around. They occupy really high velocities and they miss a lot of food. They don't capture a whole lot. So the fact that they keep on doing this over and over and over again suggests that at least sometimes there's a huge energy benefit associated with, with feeding behind lamprey. Um, we cut open some of their stomachs and, and sort of disappointing from my aspect and probably from the fish's aspect too is a lot of times their stomachs were filled with sand and silt and not insects or eggs. So I think the fish, the minnows that get there first are the ones who get the, the, the smorgasbord of eggs and insects, the ones who get there late, all they get are silt. Um, but the next step would be to test this with juvenile salmon. So then the last part of the research I want to tell you about, I've got a, a PhD student who just finished up. He's actually gainfully employed now as a professor, so I guess I've produced a clone of myself to go on and doing meaningless stuff. Well, anyway, so he was very interested in, in looking at how lampreys serve as vectors of energy and nutrients and how they link stream habitats, forest habitats, and oceans. And so just a slightly different life cycle diagram here. So we've got these juvenile, these, or sorry, these larval lamprey that are, that are filter and deposit feeding inside a stream in these slow, silty areas. And these streams are typically really heavily forested. And most of the food that comes into these lamprey probably are from leaf litter, little tiny pieces of leaf litter that are broken down, um, maybe some algal cells that are sloughed off. Well, anyway, so these guys transform, they go down to the ocean, they um, pick up huge reserves of marine-derived nutrients and energy. They do about 98% of their growing out in the open ocean where it's productive. They come back up, they spawn, they die, their carcasses decompose, and the question is, do, do the, the 
nutrients from the carcasses then end up into the amacetes and improve their growth rate. And essentially these lamprey would be linking all these three different habitats. So there's some, some studies done from other places in a, uh, a similar stream to Sejunkadunk. And so we use some of their estimates for how much energy and, and materials these lamprey deliver. And so just a back of the envelope calculation suggested that in Sejunkadunk stream in 2012, about 300 lamprey, lamprey would have brought something like 20 kilograms of nitrogen and a kilogram of phosphorus. Um, so averaged over the entire stream, we're not quite sure if that's biologically meaningful or not. And so that prompted us to do a series of studies. So started with, with actually a previous grad student to, to Rob. We went through about five or six iterations of these types of studies. So we decided to do carcass experiments where we added carcasses, we put them in cages, um, and we put tiles downstream of them. And these tiles would collect al any algae that would colonize. The idea that these rotting carcasses should increase production of algae in the streams. So we, would, we started by just um, dropping off individual carcasses in the stream. We did some chemical analysis and we found that first of all for their body tissue their nitrogen phosphorus ratio was really high. It was about 20 to 1 and if you're familiar with a lot of aquatic ecology about 6 to 1 is sort of the optimal nitrogen phosphorus nitrogen ratio. So these guys are very very poor in phosphorus um, probably because they don't have bones um, but they're relatively rich in nitrogen so if the stream is nitrogen limiting limited, they could be a boon. If the stream is phosphorus limited, they probably don't do a whole lot. So very rich in nitrogen compared to phosphorus. And then we weighed these carcasses. And I don't know if you've ever weighed rotting, wet, soaking wet lamprey carcasses over time, but it's kind of difficult and it's disgusting too. But anyway, so they rotted pretty quickly. They lost about 60% of their body mass in the first week and over four weeks, about 80 to 90% of their body mass under ambient temperatures. So they're de decomposing really quickly. Early summer is also when stream temperatures are up and the metabolic needs of aquatic insects and fish are high. So this might be a really important pulse of nutrients and energy at a time when the stream is limiting. Well, then we decided to do this a little bit better. So we, we have a lab experiment where we took carcasses and we put them in these individual buckets and we could uh, measure the outflow of nutrients and we could regulate the water temperature to get a better idea of how fast they, they liberate nutrients. And so up here you can see ammonium is at the top and phosphorus is at the bottom. And so we get a spike of ammonium and a spike, spike of phosphorus really early on, especially at high temperatures. And the phosphorus is essentially gone really quickly, very quick pulse and gone. The ammonium, uh, it can be protracted out through the summer. So there's, there's different um, nutrients that are coming in at different forms and different concentrations depending on temperature. So it's probably pretty complicated to predict what those nutrients will actually do for stream algae and invertebrates and whatnot. Then we went back to our, our carcass edition. Now we decided we're going to seed whole reaches with carcasses. So we tried doing high density, about 15 kilograms of rotting lamprey tissue per 100 meter reach and low densities. We had upstream downstream comparisons. And so that's what our streams end up looking like. There's, you know, lamprey sort of scattered haphazardly around at some, some density. And you can see we're wearing our masks and we, we rub uh, the Vicks under our noses because the, the smell is just absolutely putrid. Absolutely, yeah, just terrible working with lamprey carcasses. And then we also tried to do some um, experiments on nutrient limitation. So we put in these substrates that have these little glass tiles on the top here and they would um, collect algae, algae would colonize. And then the, the, those vials were spiked with either nitrogen, phosphorus, nitrogen and phosphorus, or nothing as a control. So that would tell us which of those nutrients is the most limiting for the stream. And so we put these, um, nutrient diffusing substrates above and below carcasses. We measured the algal biomass. We would measure nutrients in stream water. We measure some benthic invertebrate abundances and then we'll, we'll go to stable isotopes a little later. And so for this experiment, we didn't see anything other than we found out these streams are nitrogen limited. 
So it didn't matter whether these tiles were just below a carcass or upstream of a carcass. There was no difference. The carcasses didn't do anything for the algal growth, but adding nitrogen did. So we were able to at least conclude the streams are nitrogen limited. And so keeping that in the back of our mind, lamprey are rich in nitrogen over phosphorus, so maybe lamprey could relieve nitrogen limitation. So then we decided we're just going to now just saturate the stream with carcasses. We're going to try doing anywhere from low to really high densities and see if there's a threshold or a, cu or a cumulative effect that you need a certain quantity of lamprey in an area. Bomb? That is a carcass bomb, yes. There are probably 10 lamprey in there or so. Oh, yeah. And then we, we took out the, the Moab, the mother of all lamprey bombs with these lobster cages with something like 50 kilograms of lamprey in them. Um, probably simulating an incredibly high spawning run, but maybe realistic. And it turns out that at least for algae growth, when you have a high enough carcass density, you get this cumulative effect where eventually um, algae respond. So these lamprey carcasses in high enough density will improve algae growth. So increase primary productivity of the stream. And then we wanted to see, okay, let's close the loop, see if we can connect the larval lamprey who are feeding on filter feeding detritus with the adult lamprey who have been parasitic, came back to the stream to die, to see if we can connect those two somehow. So the next step was to start trying to quantify the larvae, the amicid abundance. And so here's the Junkadunk stream. Here's all the places where we found uh, nests of lamprey. And we just broke the stream up into five areas, A through, or six areas, A through F, depending on what the substrate was like. And we used this, we just built a little sampler here and essentially dug out the substrate. And you can see the, the marks left there. So it's quantitative. We can get a known quantity of substrate. And so we moved an awful lot of sand and mud and gravel, um, you know, for, for weeks at a time, just going out there, digging up the substrate, running everything through sieves. Oh, I guess you can't see it. The lighting's not that good, but you would, you would see a whole bunch of squirming little amicetes in there. And so we got some estimates of amicete density. And so it turns out there were really only two hot spots in this stream. Everything else was relatively devoid of lamprey. But anywhere from zero to 100 amicetes per meter squared, which zero is on the very low end. 100 is not quite high. There are densities of several hundreds in places like Great Lakes tributaries. On reaches, eight, eight to 30 per meter squared. So that gives us about 15,000 per couple hundred meter long reaches. Um, so not huge abundances, but again, this is only a few years after dam removal. So these fish seem to be recolonizing and spawning pretty quickly. And then we modified our technique a little bit and now we're using electrofishing to catch the amicetes instead of digging them up. So we block off some sections near the, near the shoreline. That's Tom Evans over there who was a visiting grad student from SUNY ESF who did some of his work in collaboration with us. Um, and then, so then we just did a survey around the Penobscot watershed and in no particular order, these are some streams that we thought would have pretty high lamprey, juvenile lamprey, sorry, larval lamprey abundance as many as 50 per meter squared. Again, not super high, but not inconsequential. And we found a whole lot of locations with no larvae. And so we have a pretty good idea of hot spots for lamprey in the watershed. And the idea is go back after the dams, the main stem dams in the Penobscot have been removed for a couple years and see if those sites have responded. And then the question is, do larvae or other benthic animals, insects, and mussels actually assimilate the nutri nutrients from, liberated from the carcasses? And so um, how many people here have heard of stable isotope analysis? A few people? So essentially, um, different forms of uh, molecules like carbon and nitrogen and uh, sulfur in some cases um, can give you clues as to the origin of the food source of an organism. Essentially, they are what they eat. And if you plot the relative enriching of the heavy isotope of carbon here and relative enrichment of nitrogen up here, essentially your primary producers are down here, stuff that eats them up here and so on, and your top predators are up in this portion of the graph. So they're becoming more and more enriched with these stable isotopes. So what you do is you sample the tissue, you run a stable isotope analysis, and it tells you essentially where the feeding position of those organisms are. 
But another good thing about stable isotopes is it can also discern between fresh water and marine origin of food. So fresh water would be relatively um, uh, depauperate in, in the heavy carbon and nitrogen. Marine environments would be relatively enriched with those forms. And so the adult sea lamprey would be coming into the stream bringing a really significant marine signature, very easy to detect. Presumably, the amicetes would be feeding almost entirely on detritus, and they would be down in that left-hand corner. And we would expect if the carcasses, oops, sorry, let's see, how do we go here? If the carcasses are feeding the amicetes, the amicetes stable isotope signature would move up over time and become more like the, sea, the adult sea lamprey, the carcass. And so we had a student who essentially did that for a bunch of organisms, but I'll show you a couple here. So predaceous stoneflies, here's the, lamp, the adult lamprey, the marine signature. Here's where the stonefly started out at. And over time, when they had access to the carcasses, their signature sort of moved towards the adult lamprey. Uh, Hel Helgramites here kind of moved up towards the, the adult lamprey. So there's some evidence that nutrients from the sea lamprey carcasses are somehow getting into these predators. And then we have the juvenile lamprey, or the, the uh, larval lamprey here. Here's where they started out. And their signature shifted a bit over time. So there's some evidence that they're incorporating some of those carcass uh, nutrients in their tissues. And then the last thing I'll show you, you know, we're, well, we're about an hour. We started a little bit late, almost done. So then my student, Dan, he built the simulation model. So he essentially said he built himself a, a virtual population of lamprey. And he said, okay, so these lamprey come into spawn and some of the larvae survive and they go through one year, two year, three years, so on and so forth. And how many years they spend in the stream is a function of their growth rate. Well, the growth rate is going to be influenced by how many nutrients that the adult lampreys bring in. And so essentially he's building a model here to link larval growth with nutrients brought in by the adults. And so he did a, he did a baseline run. You can ignore this sort of stuff at the beginning. The model is sort of burning in. But eventually when this model equilibrates, um, we see a difference between the number of adults that come back if they're allowed in the model to get nutrients from the previous spawners versus the number of adults that come back if they don't get to use nutrients from the previous spawners. So if they incorporate nutrients from the carcasses, populations can increase by about 20%. So not huge, but not inconsequential probably. But then the interesting thing was the nutrients from the adults stimulated growth of the larvae. The larvae have to reach somewhere between 120 and 160 millimeters to metamorphose and go down to be parasites in the, in the open ocean. And so if they incorporate nutrients from the adults, they grow faster and they can metamorphose one to two years earlier. So they can leave earlier at a larger body size. So there's less mortality. They have a higher probability of surviving out in the open ocean. Again, these are simulation models. The next step would then to be ground truth this stuff. Well, that's essentially the, the, the story that I wanted to tell about sort of sea lamprey in general, but also some of the research that we've been doing um, in the Penobscot River. And I think there's a pretty compelling case to be made that these sea lamprey are probably very important components of this native fish community that used to be abundant here in Maine, probably critical for the success of restoring Atlantic salmon because of their effects on the ecosystem engineering, delivery of marine derived nutrients, habitat conditioning, and so on and so forth. So that's all that I have. And if anybody has any questions, comments, whatever, arguments, now's the time. When when they attach to a, a fish like a salmon yep. and a striped bass, do they detach after a certain point in time? Yep. When they are satiated, they'll detach. And there was a, back in the 70s, um, they built bioenergetics models of the lamprey that predicted um, 
how, how much blood a lamprey would take from a host fish and how long they would stay attached. And it was a function of lamprey size and water temperature. A large host fish with one or two small lampreys, it usually doesn't do anything to the host fish. But if you have a small, weakened host fish with a lot of large lampreys, it can kill them. It takes something like three or four lamprey wounds to kill an average trout or salmon in the Great Lakes. But not enough to cripple the survival of that other species that's being preyed upon. It, well, historically, no. If, if, it, clearly, it doesn't do it in the ocean. There's just too many predator fish or host fish in the ocean. Lampreys are probably limited by habitat quality and spawning streams. Great Lakes are a different story because the native fish community was decimated, decimated by a bunch of different factors. Lake trout and Atlantic salmon went extinct or nearly extinct, the lake trout in Lake Ontario a long time ago. And that was Lake Superior, lake trout, sure. So now there are exotic species, coho salmon, chinook salmon, brown trout, steelhead. So left to their own devices, the lamprey population exploded and decimated those fisheries as well. So without the lamprey control measures, those exotic sport fish would probably be at very low levels. Of course, they're stocked as well. So it's, a, it's an ecosystem that's already been heavily perturbed by a variety of reasons. And now exotic lamprey are coming in. It's a very different situation where lamprey are a native component and the ecosystem was relatively intact with native species that functioned like they used to. So very different story in the Great Lakes than, than here is the point. Yeah? What are the main predators of sea lamprey? And how has their yep. abundance kind of changed over time? Uh, not many predators. Certainly fish will eat them. Um, people who fish for striped bass like using amacetes, you know, little lamprey about yay big or so. Of course, they use eels too, so I would imagine anything a striped bass that looked like that a striped bass would eat. Um, nobody really knows how important predation is for controlling populations or limiting populations of the larval lamprey. Um, probably not super important. It's probably more competition for space. When you crowd too many lamprey, little lamprey in an area, their growth rate suffers. So predation probably doesn't limit them. It's for adults, nobody knows. They're out in the open ocean. Certainly something eats them, but there are factors other than predators that are limiting lampreys. See any interaction with eels in habitat? Uh, probably, probably minimal. I, I would guess they don't interact very much. They just don't overlap in directly in space and time very much, and they do very different things. Do we have a, a sushi business uh, potential with uh, amacetes? Uh, man, if you want to eat them, go ahead. But <laughs> well, I think they are eaten in Europe, right? Lamprey, yeah, lamprey are a delicacy yeah. in Europe, yeah. and of course, there's the story that that Henry the was it Henry the Eighth. One of the Henrys apparently um, got food poisoning from a batch of bad lampreys, and that's how he died. But yeah, lamprey were, were a delicacy and still are, but there, a lot of the species are endangered, so there's not a whole lot of commercial fishing, fishing for them anymore in Europe. The, um, uh, the, is it the Umatillas? One of the tribes up in the Pacific Northwest, um, the Pacific lamprey are very important for them for food and for cultural significance, and they, they love them. Wow. I had a, are they very different fish? Or? They're, they're, I mean, they're, they're different species and different genera, but they're, they, they're similar in the sense that they're both parasitic ocean-going lamprey, yeah. My former grad student, Rob Hogg, his son was, um, was part Umatilla or one of those tribes up there. So he spent a summer on one of the reservations, and he was catching Pacific lamprey when Rob was out here catching sea lamprey. And so he ate one of the Pacific lamprey, and he said they're not good at all. That was the report I got. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't eat an adult lamprey. Not after seeing what they look like coming up in the streams. Maybe out in the open ocean, but not when they're decomposing themselves. They probably have to smoke them. Yeah. You could probably, I'm not sure if you get high yeah, off of them, but you could before. smoke them. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so, uh, what, what time of year do they migrate up into the street? Uh, down, so in southern Maine, here maybe a little s more south throughout southern New England, probably April to early May. It, when you go up uh, northern Maine, New Brunswick, maybe as late as June. 
And the, the ones that go very far upstream in a watershed will usually migrate sooner. The ones that only penetrate a small distance upstream will usually migrate later. So in Sajunkadunk, that's one of the latest runs in the state for whatever reason. They're over by July 1st or so, but a stream next door, the Kanduskeg, they're done by mid-May. It's highly dependent on temperature and flow. And how long are they before they die? Uh, less than weeks, oh. days to weeks, yep. They, they'll, pre they'll stage in large rivers below tributaries um, after ice out, but they don't do much milling around and they don't start moving into the small streams until flow has gone down, temperature has gone up, and um, photo period has increased. Nitrogen is often an issue when we get into talking about L wives and L wife restoration. Yep. <coughs> I wondered if, if I heard you right, these guys are producing some nitrogen or putting. Inputting nitrogen yep. into the system, so I'm going to guess it probably hasn't come up yet. But as we get into these issues around the political implications of mm -hmm. do well lives contribute nitrogen or take out nitrogen? Yep. You know, should we reintroduce or not? Sea lamprey might not fare so favorably when you've got a green yeah. lake to start with. Well. Or, their, their abundances are so low compared to alewife, which are, you know, can be in the millions. Yeah. My guess is just by the sheer numbers, the alewife would be more important, even if most of them don't die, just through their excretion, their gametes. There was a, a study um, from uh, some of the people at Yale, um, David Post works on alewife, and he, his students did a modeling study coupled with some, some data, and they showed that under certain conditions, um, the alewife could be net exporters of phosphorus. So they weren't concerned about nitrogen, they were concerned about phosphorus. So under certain conditions, they can export phosphorus, but, and, and it turns out that the phosphorus they bring in is actually on the same order of magnitude that a, that a strong Pacific salmon run would bring. So alewife phosphorus, one might be concerned if the stream, if the lake is already eutrophic. Um, maybe the, f the first thing you might want to do is reduce the anthropogenic loading from septic systems and things like that and let the natural come in, but that's just my opinion. But I would say people probably wouldn't be concerned. There are other th reasons people don't like lamprey beyond the fact that they bring some nitrogen up, but I'm, I wouldn't be worried about that. So are there places sort of saying that the numbers of sea lamprey are maybe inconsequential in, in terms of some of this? Probably. <clears throat> you did some heavy loading. Yep. When you were doing your experimenting. Yeah. Are there places where there are really high, you know, loads of lamprey? Or? There, are, I haven't, I haven't visited places, but I've heard reports from the Sheepskit River mm -hmm. um, that have tons of lamprey. There's a Pleasant River down east that there, um, there's some commercial harvesting there for biological supply companies. And apparently the lamprey stack up by the thousands underneath the falls and you can just go pick them up with your hands. Um, but as far as the, the nutrient input of lampreys, the only studies that I know of are the, the one study I referred to and then our back of the envelope calculations. But I'm hoping that when we have some better information, we, we can start to, to um, nail those numbers down better. But I think they're inconsequential compared to owl life. There is a gentleman, I'm sorry he wasn't here tonight, he lives a couple of blocks from here, helps us out at Bay Day, who used to teach science in the area, and he used to collect oh, okay. okay. for biology. Yep. And said he, he, he sewed uh, uh, bottle caps onto his gloves <laughs> to better grab them. Oh, neat, yep. It didn't sound like you were having a whole lot of trouble grabbing them there. Didn't look that's, like a, that's a way to do it, yeah, interesting. Yeah, we just use cotton or wool gloves. Uh, he was, he was doing that in Bowdenham, mm -hmm. actually, and then Cooper's Mills is a popular spot. Yep. Filming, how do you, how do, you do your, you some great shots there. Oh, just to. I can to, watch them all day with you. Yeah. How, how are those taken? Just a, a, a simple camera that worked underwater. Mm -hmm. I, I don't even recall what, what kind it is. And were you just with someone lying there watching? Yep. Or, just me, usually. That's how I would spend a lot of my summers. The grad students would be off doing the hard work, and I'd be just sitting there watching Lamprey. Great. Thank you very much. So, Anybody else? So, let's, have, let's let you pick a raffle winner for this fine uh, vest we have here. All right. Okay, and the winner is...
Well, I know I didn't put my name in there, I so well, there. I don't need that. <laughs> Let's go for how about Richard Brown? Hey. You get it. All right. Okay. Well, thank you so much again. And, uh, well, good. I'm glad you showed up on a nice chilly night. Yeah, it's and, chilly uh, in here yeah. too, isn't it? Hopefully, you enjoyed it. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you. No, you're very welcome. How many years?